Thank you. There, we are recording in progress. So thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, somebody else, what were your reactions to January 6th? What were you feeling? This is Jim, I couldn't really believe it was what was happening, I guess, it didn't seem real. Um, Kathy and I were in, at the breakfast table, I think, and she told me to turn off Trump's speech because she can't stand him. Um, but I decided it seemed like something important and kept it on and things kept on getting worse. Okay. I guess this is John. Uh, to me, this is something that I've never seen and was not aware of had ever happened before. So it was concerning to me that uh, uh, something that uh, this monumental was taking place. And um, yeah, I, I had concerns and worries. Yeah, Patty's raising her hand. Patty, you wanna talk? <laughs> not raising my, I was just really surprised that there wasn't more protection at the Capitol. Um, I was surprised that there, yeah, that, you know, that just wasn't the force. I, my daughter had a meeting that she was supposed to be going to, which was right before you get into Washington, one exit before entering the city. And they had closed off that highway so she didn't have to worry about missing her exit and ending up in DC. They had closed off a lot of highways so they knew something was coming, but there didn't seem to be any real preparation other than that. Yeah. You know, I felt a little, just be honest about that. I mean, I, I certainly was deeply concerned and almost overwhelmed. I didn't start at the beginning. I kind of caught in the middle of things, but I felt kind of naive, like what in the world are we watching? I, I just yeah. couldn't hardly yeah. believe that this mm -hmm. was going on. I certainly couldn't have told you at that time two cents worth about Christian nationalism. I, I really couldn't. I, I, I'd heard of it. I, I knew things about it, but... I feel like I was caught off guard and almost feel a little embarrassed by that. It's like I should have known more. I should have been more aware of what might be coming and what might be the thoughts of certain people in this country. One comment about the material you sent out, Pastor Vern. Uh, when I saw that there were, there were two items, I thought there'd be one from each side. But after reading them, it seems like they're both from the same side. I was hoping for something from the other side so we could try to understand it better. Does anybody have any knowledge of anything on the other side that's instructive? Well, I think both articles had plenty of things that would at least describe things that might have been um, felt um, by people that might not have thought like you. Um, there, there were evangelical Christians that thought they were defending the future of America and uh, and God's uh, steadfastness and righteousness. And so, yeah, I, I suppose I could have looked for something exactly the same, but I just found two articles and thought I'd send them out. Uh, I suspect we might lift up some other articles tonight. I'm glad to send out other things. But um, uh, so if, if that shows up tonight, don't be afraid to raise your hand and I'll send out other things. I'll clog up all this email. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of stuff to read. Yeah. And I was really um, astounded that this is Kathy. So many, this oh, this is Kathy Peterson. Um, just really astounded that so many people could be using their survival brain, not even trying to think uh, with, with you know with purpose or trying to be mindful about what is going on. It it just oh, what people could do. It's really really scary. Yeah. Does anyone has anyone heard how many people were at the at the demonstration that day? Does anyone have any number? I don't have a number. No. I don't know that I've ever seen it. I know not everyone walked towards the Capitol, obviously, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it had to be several hundred, right, at least? Well, I think they've arrested like 400 people. So, I mean, there was quite a number that entered the Capitol. But yeah, I just didn't know how many, you know, they'd show outside, you know, people milling around, but you're not sure, you know, how do you even estimate how many were there? 
that's it. Yeah. I've got an item. Um, wondering if it would be interesting to discuss the motivation behind it is to me, the motivation was fear. And where does that fear come from? Um, I think there's multiple things. Uh, maybe that would be something later on we could address. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I think yeah. that will become a part of this conversation, but it's a good point. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, we kind of knew something might be up because of, uh, you know, talk of a rigged election and uh, the possibility that something had been stolen. And uh, there are people that are willing to put their lives on the line at times like that um, because they want to right to wrong uh, and undo something that's been a terrible injustice. So uh, you can call that fear. You can call that uh, righteous indignation. Uh, you can call it anger. You can call it lots of different things. But uh, I think some of that was going on. I think you're right, John. Yeah. And then I'm wondering if we could follow up after that, you know, whether this was right or wrong, because to me it was wrong because that is not uh, what our democracy says, that we sell our arguments politically, not uh, through violence. So, so um, the it was used, um, you know, I don't know. Yeah. So what did uh, let's let's just go out on the limb. We've got the press and variety of other peoples have struggled with what to call this. What the, what word would you describe to what you witnessed? Uh, me. What word would you describe? Well, for, uh, I guess for me, this is John, um, one word, but I'll tell you what, I got to think about that. Somebody else go first. Well, I, I think of insurrection. It's Lois. It's Lois. And I don't know why I'm echoing. Um, because the police were there to protect the Capitol, even though they were, looked like about a dozen policemen and they were not treating them like law enforcement. They were treating them as enemies. And, you know, the more you see of the, the videos of what was happening, the sense I was getting was that they felt they were right. They had been invited into the Capitol to right a wrong. At, but they were not using lawful means. So it was worse than a riot, I think. Mm -hmm. I struggle a little bit with violent protest and we'll probably talk about that a little bit more later on too. But it felt like a violent protest to me. It, it, it did. And uh, I've never been real comfortable when I see the violence of that. And this was over the top violence. Uh, I guess I didn't have an understanding of why, the why of it, and, uh, and uh, who was inside the building and what kind of danger were people under as they seemed to be going after people like Vice President Pence and others. Um, it just was hard to get a handle on some of those things at first for me. When I think about an answer to this question, I think about the Republicans now are supposedly trying to gerrymander things so they can override the election. What will happen next time if they do that and we're on the other side? What will be the right action for us? What would we call it? Mm -hmm. Would it be righteous then? I, well, I'm not about to call it righteous now. <laughs> and, and so I can't believe that I'm gonna call it righteous uh, whatever happens down the road. I mean, one of the things I said early on, I got a few, a little pushback on it, but I, I believe in the tradition of, um, of conceding elections. And I said that early on in in the middle of November, let's have a concession because it's a long-standing tradition. It allows us to go on as a people and not doubt, question every every vote that's taken, every local um, 
election process is taking place, and uh, it's it's just a, 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 a decent, polite way to go forward. Uh, it didn't happen, but uh, it's hard when your way doesn't win uh, sometimes, and to not be able to concede uh, makes it worse, I think. I hope we concede. That's what I'm saying, Jim. Whatever side uh, loses, I hope they concede. Cheryl here. Um, I'm thinking how, I'm thinking back to the election in 2000 when it was all hanging on the hanging chads in the Supreme Court and Gore conceded. I mean, it was, we've had civilized concessions before. This yeah, was really yeah. unique. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I was a pastor back in those days too. I, I said pretty much the same thing out loud, you know, it's like, I, I think sooner or later, somebody's got to win and somebody else has got to then lose and let's let the governing go on and the, and the democracy to be able to continue. But I don't think that Trump has ever conceded, has he? No, not that no. I know. I mean, and that's why there is a real problem. Earlier, you asked about which word would we use and Lois said in, she thinks of this as an insurrection and you said a violent demonstration. I looked up the Webster's definition of insurrection because then I go, okay, I was thinking it was an insurrection. So an insurrection is an act or instance of revolt against a civil authority or an established government. So I think it was an insurrection. Yeah. It just scares me to think if they had gotten a hold of some of the people they were chanting about with that mob mentality. Yeah. Uh, it just, I mean, I was just terrified watching it, you know, as they were showing inside the Senate or the House of Representatives and people crawling around on the floor. And uh, I'm just thankful they didn't. And that, you know, the, the courage of some of the officers in the building and other people, I guess, and the grace of God. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. they did lock away the, you know, the legislators were put in a safe place. And then there was the policeman who misled the people running in there, yeah. who's he's actually gotten an award for yeah. misguiding them and sending they thought he was being helpful and like oh yeah they're going up there so you know they followed his directions but he was um leading them on a goose chase and that was good <laughs> i'm glad he got an award and recognition for that yeah it's kind of interesting and we don't need to be, belabor this point but how over time um the way that we walk back from some of the initial things that were said, whether it was an insurrection or something else, and suddenly it becomes something much different in our thinking. Well, there, there, wasn't a, there weren't any arms, there weren't any guns. Uh, it, it really could have just been a raucous uh, political um, tour going on in the Capitol. You know, it, it, we walk back these things almost to the point of absurdity sometimes, and we, we have a hard time naming them. And saying this was this was something that was downright scary and seemed wrong to a whole lot of people at the time and still does, yeah. So what did you? Uh, here's another question. What did you make? You must have seen some of the religious symbols: crosses, Jesus saves, banners, Christian flags, prayers that were offered up uh, for God to empower the efforts of those who stormed the Capitol. What did you make of those things? Do you remember seeing them? What did you think? I was not watching it live. I, I watched reruns later and I was shocked, shocked at the number of Christian symbols there saying like, I believe in the separation of, of you know, government and church and state. And I going like, I was shocked to see it all. It's like, what are they doing there? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. What are they doing there? Thomas Jefferson believed in the strict separation of church and state. He believed in religious freedom. Yeah. You know, all these people are claiming to be constitutionalists, but the Constitution separates the church and state. 
uh, this is John. I felt that the symbols in no way matched the actions. The actions were not in a, a Christian way. Yeah, That's but, a good comment, said, John. Turn, turn the other cheek, blessed are the peacemakers, those kind of things, John. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's not the Jesus that I envision when I think of Jesus, put it that way. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Phil here. I, I finally have a camera on. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, I've been watching Christian nationalism for a number of years now. So uh, this did not come out of nowhere. And um, uh, I remember, oh, five, six years ago, going to a movie at uh, oh, the Cinemagic Theater. It was a special showing of something called Four Blood Moons by a Christian Zionist. And I thought I could just walk out there and go in. And uh, I bought a ticket ahead of time. The place was absolutely packed. And there's a whole subculture of radical right wing nationalistic uh, kind of pro Israel Christianity that we in our, our Lutheran uh, main line have no awareness of. And uh, there's another book I, I bought last fall, Kristen Dumez. Cobes Dumez books, Jesus and John Wayne, where she talks about, oh, have, have you ever heard of that book? Uh, kind of the masculinity, the hardcore masculinity uh, emphasized in some of right-wing Christianity. And of course, they're not interested in religious freedom. They're interested in a Christian America. Yeah. And so the Constitution, uh, they don't, they wear, they carry the Constitution, but they don't read it. And uh, uh, it, they believe in a Christian America, and we're losing a Christian America. Yeah. And so, yeah. remember that banner that said, "I trust in Jesus" as part of the crowd. Uh, there were thousands in in that uh, demonstration, and hundreds reached the Capitol. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But that I trust in Jesus. So there's a lot of Jesus stuff that bears nothing to do with Jesus. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. Or if, if you remember Lafayette Square last a year ago, the the photo op um, yeah. with Trump holding the Bible upside down in front of the Episcopal Church. And um, I use that in class, actually, as an illustration of a, a type of um, using of religious symbols for political uh, purposes. So anyway, this this uh, this was a tragic event. And uh didn't come out of nowhere. It's yeah. been brewing for a number of years. So I'm sorry, I don't mean to go on a rant, but uh, no. or shut down discussion. Um, but I think those articles are uh, do bring out both sides. But the, the other side is there's no room for <laughs> black <laughs> black Americans in it, to be honest. Um, and uh, it, it's it's uh, it's very severe. You know, I don't quite understand, you know, one of the, I mean, the main- This is, this is Kathy, by the way. Kathy. Oh, Kathy. Kathy, yeah. Um, the, the main tenet is love your neighbor as you would like to be loved. Treat them the way you want to be treated. How can the, the Christian nationalist justify this then? I, I, I just- you know, they they totally don't don't care about the other, do they? Well, I can't speak for all of them, but I know you're kind of a lover, Kathy. So uh, it comes yeah. out of your every poor. It does. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, not, not everybody's wired that way. I know it. But I mean, when you've got people who say that love is the answer, compassion is the answer. But you if, if they are so Christian and they follow Christ and they want everybody to be sure that they're you know, following Christ, how can they ignore his command? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I hear you. Can I speak? Right away, I'm thinking of uh, some of the hymns that we have in our hymnal. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching has to yes. war. Or, With the cross of Jesus, going on before. I, I don't think I could sing some of those songs ever again. No. Not, not that I was singing them anyway. But uh, just hard to sing some of that kind of song with that verbiage at times. Yeah, I feel. Uh, 
Go ahead. One problem I see with this is that um, we are, the word Christian nationalism has those two words. We think of ourselves as Christian. When most people think about that, they think we're part of that. Why haven't we distinguished ourselves from that? Why don't we go out there and say what we think publicly like they do? Well, that's a good question. You know, that we won't probably get into Dietrich Bonhoeffer very much, but that's essentially what he ended up doing. He could not be part of the German Christian church. He, he became part of a confessing church and thought what he deeply believed. He eventually paid for it with his life. But uh, yeah, you got to you got to admire people that stand up and say, this is what I believe. And uh, Bonhoeffer's even got a, a quote that gets used, or not a quote, but a, a phrase that gets used in connection with him. Is this a Bonhoeffer moment? So you could you could be asking that question, Jim, any of us could be. Is this a Bonhoeffer moment that we are up against? Yes, uh, what? Yep. Who said that? I did. Al, said, go ahead. Um, <laughs> we we tend to be conservative in our views. Mm -hmm. We in no way support any of the events of of the sixth. In fact, we are quite discouraged by them. Horrified. Horrified by them would be better, but. I guess what I'm trying to say is we're probably more fiscal conservatives and more socially liberal. And I once told uh, Bishop John Anderson in the Southwest, I said, uh, one of the worst things you can be in the Lutheran church is a, is a conservative. And he said, well, there's plenty of room for everybody. But, you know, I, I don't feel very welcome by, you know, we're not direct descendants of a Cro-Magnon man. And, uh, you know, we don't have sloped foreheads. We are capable of rational thought. And I think I, I was a Democrat. I belonged to the Young Democrats when I was in college. And that's what I look at most of all as the fiscal side of things. And I've borrowed enough money in my lifetime to know that it's a lot tougher to, to pay back money than it is to borrow it. And I heard part of what Phil was saying, and I'm not, you know, I'm not denying anything that, that Phil said. Uh, he's a product of Watson, Minnesota, so we have to, we have to <laughs> hold him up. But I don't know if anybody understands what I'm trying to say. Um, well, there's there's a reason for conservatism. Uh, you know, there's a reason for two parties systems. I don't think you should need to apologize. Thank you for sharing that, Al. Um, I think a lot of people, I read some things, so oh, I forget his name, Henry French, I think. Um, and Henry French talks a lot about being an evangelical conservative, but he just can't abide by some of the events, a lot of the events that he saw coming out of uh, out of no, no. January 6th and even before. Like, what, one of the things that really upset me was looking at one of the sites of these splinter groups and they had an ad Covenant Church and our son is a pastor in the Evangelical Covenant Church and that's in no way shape or form a part of any of this. He, he is he would agree totally with what Phil said and what the articles say. And yeah. I, I felt upset about that because I hope people don't get the idea that the evangelical church approves of this kind of junk. I think some a lot of it depends on who your pastor happens to be. Um, God forgive us all sometimes for the things we... <laughs> stand for and, and the way we communicate it. But uh, I think a lot of churches get caught up in, in the sway of, should we say, a pastor. I'm not saying anything about your son, but uh, it happens. It certainly happens. It's happened in evangelical circles. 
Uh, it's happened in Lutheran circles. Um, but um, I think having, having people in the pew that our chair, we will call them chairs now, having people in the chairs that are uh, acquainted with who Jesus is and what basic theology is might just stand up and say, I don't know if I can abide by this. Yeah. I wrote down a few of the Amen. I, I don't know if I, I wrote down a few of the quotes that I was hearing from people. Um, you know, Pastor. Could I just comment? This is Rebecca. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Can I just comment and thank? I want to thank you, Alan, for speaking up and saying, you know, you are a conservative and, and you don't share the views of the people on January 6th. In my family, we have, you know, we have mixed political parties yeah. in my family and I, I have a son and daughter-in-law who have worked for the Republican Party and uh, you know believe in the conservative principles and I think that's just fine but they've been appalled by yeah. the actions and yes. even the way some of the Minnesota I mean one dot my daughter-in-law is employed by some of the uh, Republicans and at the way they have been treating her because she believes in getting shots for COVID. Oh, and they've yeah. been like, they've gone so far as to make fun of her. That's and stupid. that is stupid. Why would you want to make fun of anybody if they're your employee? Um, you know, but anyway, it's it's really affected their feelings about the Republican Party, just like it's affected some of us who are saying, oh the evangelical Christians are the ones who are doing this. It's, it's giving Christians a bad name, yep. is what I, you know, which is a, a very terrible, worrisome thing. And I, I don't care so much to be called a Republican. I view myself more as a conservative. I'm not- Well, great, uh, fiscal conservative, yeah, that's fine. That people should just do whatever they want. I can't think of the right term right now, but- no Libertarian. Yeah. Libertarian. yeah. I don't, I don't go along with that stuff either, but. But thank you for speaking. I, I, I think conservative uh, is a perfectly good term. And, uh, and, and so I would support that too. And even a, a, a confessional Lutheran in theologically could be considered conservative uh, by, compared to, uh, to some things. But uh, I, I think it has to do with the distortions of the cult that, yeah. uh, is affecting things and and cons and it's distorted the perception of the meaning of the word conservative so and ruth is sitting next to me here and she'll hit me if i say All something wrong sudden, like, I, yeah, right. I, saw and I thought oh my there's somebody much better looking scary <laughs> scary <laughs> a couple of the quotes if you read them in the articles greg Locke said we are one election away from losing everything we hold dear the battle is against everything evil and wicked in the world. You know, say what you want to, but when it feels like it's a matter of right and wrong, good and evil, God and the devil, sometimes you'll do almost anything and, and maybe even lose your mind in the process. And uh, there's plenty of folks out there that throw away what seemed like um, a well-meaning Christianity and and turn it into something completely different and uh, I think that's what's happened by with some pastors in our culture uh, we can talk about politics every week but after a while sooner or later it, it just would eat us alive I think if we tried to do that can I say one last thing I just yes you can and I so much appreciate the uh, spirit that what I said was accepted in I, I was dreading this meeting something years. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Be yep. Yeah. Something else. Yep. God bless you all. You betcha. <clears throat> One of the things we haven't mentioned yet that's a factor, I think. Say is who some, you are. Oh, this is I'm sorry, Ruth Johnson here. Um, and more and more shows and other things on TV and looking into this is the whole conspiracy theories, the kind of QAnon and the sort of cults. Uh, that these organizations uh, have gotten going and that people have become really true believers in these theories and uh, many of their friends and family are are struggling too because there's nothing they can really do to dissuade them from this and so this kind of creation of having different realities and believing something that's completely different is difficult to kind of combat and find uh, 
make, you know, can't really find common ground if you think someone's a pedophile, uh, you know, cannibal. And there are quite a few people who are, are really have moved in this direction. Yeah. Read an article maybe just a couple of days ago. Uh, it's been out for a while. It's from the New York Times. It's on Christian prophecy is on the rise. And, and you want to talk about uh, a cottage industry. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And people making predictions about everything under the sun. And uh, that in and of itself is really, really scary because there's people out there that will believe almost anything that you say mm -hmm. in the name of God and do you say in the name of Jesus. And if it if it's something that gets predicted and comes true, well, then you're just a rock star. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so talk about conspiracy theories. They're peddled right and left. They really are. Mm -hmm. Well, this is Rebecca speaking up again here too. What's frightening is when it's your own relatives. I have a cousin who is my age who goes on Facebook and she believes that Biden is a ped pedophile. And she believes in the QAnon and it's frightening. And I have, doesn't anybody else have other relatives who are involved in this? I mean, I, I have several relatives in my mother's family who are heavily invested in the far right uh, of the Republican party and it's causing a schism in the family. You'd be surprised at how many things I get handed in a week's time from people and I'm not convinced they always even know what they're handing me. You know, that's part of it. I mean, sometimes it's like, you got to read this, Pastor Vern. This is, this is really the truth. This is really important to read this and be aware because we're one election away from the whole bottom of this country falling in. You know, uh, there, there is on the flip side of this, a, a real sense of we have, to, we have to take up arms. We have to do whatever we need to do to right the wrongs of this world and protect it from ungodly, um, atheistic kind of Marxists. You know, pick your battle. Mm -hmm. So it's not just all bad thinking, but it sure ends up in bad places sometimes. It really does. Well, and the, well, the this is Kathy. And the, the personality of people who need to know what is right, that you have to believe, and that's the only way it is, you know, just, just to think of these people, they're, they're not very resilient, they're, they're not collaborative, because to talk with other people with difference of opinion would, would frighten them. I mean, yeah, to, yeah. You know, they, they have to know. And if other people don't know and believe like they do, well, I'm sorry, it's wrong. I mean, yeah. it's sad. It is really sad. And I think it's pervasive, Kathy. It really yes. is. I think it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yes. As much on the left, this uh, as much on the far left as on the far right, I think. Talk to me a little bit about the day of epiphany mm -hmm. when this happened. Do you think anybody was aware it was the day of epiphany? Talk to me about that article. I thought it was really quite ironic. And uh, the coming out of Christianity mm -hmm. Today, which is in general a conservative um, uh, newspaper or a conservative uh, magazine. Tell me about the day of epiphany and what happened. I really doubt that that had much to do with it. They, uh, that was just ironic. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. you know, got together on that particular day. and. Well, the, the, the main the, reason they did it was because of the, the final certification of the election. That's what drew them to that day. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, mm -hmm. Donald Trump would say one Corinthians. So I'm sure yeah. he was not aware. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the significance of the day doesn't it doesn't it cast a, a shadow over the whole day? I mean, the Epiphany is about light and truth and the coming of the Magi, and uh, and here we have this happening, uh, you know, uh, coming of the Magi and going to visit Herod um, to find out where the Christ child was born, and then oh, come back and tell me when you find out that I may too come and worship him, and so. I think that sense of worship and political power not being very far apart really shows up on that day. 
again, nobody's planning it that way, but it sure is ironic when it shows <laughs> up that way and uh, says a lot about how close we can all be to worshiping um, something other than the true God when, when, our, um, when our way, our, our people, our tribe is at stake. So when, when Herod told the wise men to come back and tell him, was he a left winger or a right winger? <laughs> or just, uh, he was somebody in power, that's for sure. And sometimes they'll say anything, won't they? Yeah. <laughs> And they have been lately. They've been saying anything they need to, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah, this is Phil. Uh, I, I think the irony of Epiphany is uh, um, available to us from liturgical traditions. And many evangelicals, not all, but uh, many don't really observe uh, liturgical traditions other than mm -hmm. Sunday, Christmas, and Easter. Yeah. So the notion of Lent, uh, the notion of the season of Epiphany uh, is something we would share with Catholics, you know, and Hispanic Catholics certainly observe the Three Kings Day, the French Catholics do too. Um, and uh, so we, I'm not sure that irony is available to, let's say, the right. people who belong to the, the cowboy mm -hmm. church or, you know, mm -hmm. some of these other um, self-styled uh, groups they, they just that's not part of their and, and it was it did I, I think as uh, what Lois I, I'm nice to meet you Lois I don't think we've met before but um, it, it had to do with the certification of the election and uh, and not but I always read T.S. Eliot's The Journey of the Magi on uh, Epiphany and uh, that that has kind of an uh, I recommend it to you. I'm sure it's available online. It, it, it puts the world in kind of a perspective. Um, but, but anyway, we, as a liturgical church, we can find meaning. And uh, I would hope hope out of that notion um, of epiphany. Yeah. Well, the author was an Anglican, too. So... Um, that says something about that liturgical tr tradition. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Very absolutely. much so. Those are the kind of things that are kind of get lost on everybody else out there. But uh, I, I found that article very insightful and really kind yes. of sad in its own sort of way. Very, very sad because of the, the great irony. And um, yeah, what, um, let's make sure we talk about Christian nationalism a little bit tonight. How would you describe it? Uh, Phil says he studied it for five years. Most of the rest of us haven't. So tell me about Christian nationalism. What is it? You're talking to me, Phil? Everybody. Uh, everybody. Speak up, Phil. I didn't know you were so shy. <laughs> <laughs> Who can tell me what Christian um, nationalism is before before it, we let Phil it, speak? It, yeah, <laughs> tell me. Let, let others speak. I tend to uh, speak too much. I think of it as a group of people that think that our nation was founded on Christianity and white people. And if there's mm -hmm. other types of people or other belief systems, then the country is going down the tubes and we need to keep what's right and white and Christian at the forefront and we need to be in power and they need to listen to us. This is John, I totally agree with that. I feel that they are afraid um, to uh, have power shared among people that are not of their group what? and are afraid of the results of that. There's a lot of fear there. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah. So was it, was America founded as a Christian nation? I think the principles are Christian, but it wasn't founded as, it, it's a freedom of religion, obviously, so it wasn't founded as a Christian nation, correct? Which sure doesn't, doesn't sound like anything but a Christian mm -hmm. nation in the minds of uh, Christian nationalists, I think. It, and I wouldn't be surprised if in their mind that the founding fathers were all evangelical Christians, even though, as I remember it, I think they were all a bunch of deists, by and large. Not a, de not a deist. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Phil, shed some more light on us now. It's your turn. Uh, so one of the readings said that 70% of Christian nationalists were white. So it's not all white people? I, I'd be very surprised if it's more than that. But... Yeah. I haven't uh, taken a We poll. talk about whites even, uh, we, we talk about, this is Phil, uh, we do talk about white evangelical Christianity and, and that's different from black evangelical mm -hmm. Christianity, um, which is a totally different experience. Um, and, and again, not why all white evangelicals are this kind of extremist. We have numerous evangelical friends who are not, you know, buying into this too. So uh, I think we have to be careful not to uh, group them all together. But there is a whiteness mm -hmm. in, in, to an evangelical. Uh, and they call themselves evangelicals, though they're anything but at times, I think, as others were were pointing out. And and uh, who is else saying, John, you were talking about the fear that drives them. And uh, I, I think the loss of a sense of culture, and, and this, in a sense, goes back to the 70s when they uh, felt in the 1964 Act, which opened up uh, immigration, and so uh, all these things factor together as the country has become more and more diverse and they feel like their whiteness is being challenged and then they uh, flee to their version of a white Christianity. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a really good book by a Lutheran pastor, um, Angela Denker. Do you know her, uh, Vern? Uh, the name sounds called Red... the name of the book. No, she's a pastor actually in uh, Watertown, Minnesota. And, in the, and Al will like this, she's uh, in the... Southwest Minnesota Synod. Uh, <laughs> the one, the one uh, true word of God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Al and I have a, a, a joke because I was a pastor in Watson, Minnesota, just outside of Montevideo for a few years. Um, but, but Angela Denker wrote a book called Red State Christians. Oh, yes. Yeah. Just after the that, election. Mm -hmm. and she's, I, got, I haven't read it. Yep. She is an ELCA pastor, and she has family who are, you know, on the right wing. And she traveled around the country with a very, she's a former sports writer for Sports Illustrated. And, you know, she comes with a journalistic background. And uh, it, it's a very accessible book, uh, Red State Christians, that might be something. Um, and, and this is before the January 6th disaster. But it might be worth thinking about. Yeah. I, this is Ruth. I, I thought it was good, and, and I, I read it. And I think a couple of things that stand out is that she did go all over the country. And one thing is that, you know, red state Christians are not monolithic. And she had different groups in different parts of the country who had very different kind of backgrounds. They fitted into some of these categories, but their lived experience, their kind of, so, kind of sociology of who they are, all that was quite different. And she, she was able to do a really, really good interviews with them and not in a judgmental way, just learning. I think it's really very uh, insightful and helpful if you just kind of want to understand something. You know, there's white evangelicals in Southern California who are wealthy white people and there's different ones. She visited some of her family in Missouri and she was all over the country. And uh, inter it's interesting that it, that it helps us kind of view who these people are and they're not monolithic. Could I just tell you about Montevideo a little bit? I worked with uh, <laughs> migrant, migrant students from about 1975 until uh, I finally retired in 2010. But uh, when I started, there was no acceptance of migrant kids and, and people. And it's changed so much. It only took 45, 50 years, but um, like the high school graduating class and so on. The homecoming court was about half Hispanic. The football, you know, various teams, the dance team uh, had many Hispanics. You know, it's not that everybody loves Hispanics, but at first, nobody wanted to, to you know, have anything to do with them. And that has changed so much. And I find that really encouraging. You know, the fact that they were good basketball players helped too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Generally, they're, they're not yeah. Well, there were some that were pretty good in football, and that helps too. <laughs> I think part of the part of the challenge of white or Christian nationalism would be, you know, that sense that the founding 
documents are kind of passed down from God directly, or they're yeah. pretty darn close to directly. Yeah. And uh, and so they they tell us whatever God needs us to hear, and uh, I don't know if if this totally tied up with, but I remember growing up and and hearing a lot of conversation about America being the new Israel uh, and the new promised land. And it was our job to settle this land and to be blessed by God as we did. And how many things did we do and justify when that happened? Phil, is that is that a part of Christian nationalism as you've read it and studied it? Yeah, the, the founding documents are, uh, well, we have a destiny and, and it's a chosen people. Yeah. And you do have some of that chosen people language in the early Puritan, you know, writings. Yep. Uh, C.D. on a hill, if you remember that uh, uh, image. Uh, but but the Christian nationalists would would say that the uh, founding documents are almost scriptural and inspired yeah. by God. Yeah. And uh, though they don't read them, um, yeah. and I, I would add. And I would include the Gettysburg Address <laughs> as an as a semi-inspired piece. But no, it, it, there, that uh, it, it's a mission, and that uh, and, and then there were even images in early Christianity or early America where they understood themselves as being uh, the the new Hebrew people, and of course the Native Americans are the Canaanites. Yeah. And uh, mm. what do you do with Canaanites? Um, Kill them. Well, we all know that mm -hmm. from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any scriptural basis to all that? No. Does anybody know those? Um, no. No. That's that's uh, something that you use to justify your particular <laughs> political or or religious slant. You you are blessed by God, ordained by God, uh, destined by God to take this land and settle it and be that person that God calls you to be when you do, you know, hard to find. Well, think of the place names in, in early America, New Canaan, New Canaan. Connecticut yes. and yeah. Salem, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we have St. Paul, Minnesota, but that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> pig's eye. Uh, yeah, <laughs> pig's eye. Uh, uh, but, but they were naming things, you yeah. know, with biblical names, mm -hmm. and, you know, Shiloh. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the, Ruth tells the story of the Swedes uh, who went to Pennock and uh, they built their Lutheran church and named it Mamre Lund uh, or after the Oaks of Mamre. That's what it means. That's Mamre what it means Lund. In, in Swedish. Yeah, from Genesis 12. Abraham came and settled by the Oaks of Mamre, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Yeah, and this was you know 1860s people coming from Scandinavia and other places with some sense that uh, like you know kind of a diaspora, like Abraham left his people and settled somewhere else. It uh, yeah, there was a biblical sense. So, so I have another question for you. Um, how would you compare our Christian nationalism to America's civil religion? How would you? describe America's civil mm -hmm. religion. They're different, I think. Mm -hmm. So what's civil religion? What do you think? Oh. John, are you talking or Patty? One of the two? Well, this is John. I've stopped. I think you're on mute, John. There you go. Sorry, folks. I am stumped by that question. Okay. Well, you think about the tradition, and I really think it's a bipartisan tradition of presidents kind of lifting up God and may God bless America. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think they mention Jesus too often, but mm -hmm. you, you get the sense that there's this in State of the Union addresses and other times there's an mm -hmm. That there is a religious foundation to our country. Uh, I don't get the sense that it's as as specific and strict as Christian nationalism by any means. But um, one thing you mentioned, Pastor Joe Biden now says "God bless our troops" at the end. He doesn't say "God bless our country." Anybody else notice that? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, he had, he had a son that died. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. I, I, I think, think doesn't civil civil religion kind of have the, it, it's, I think Byrne touched on this. It's a sense of God and being able to include God into our discourse, but specifically not Jesus. That's kind of the unwritten rule of, of civil religion in this country that's acceptable. Yeah. Well, and I get the sense that yeah, we are a nation of, full of people of faith. But I think it's broader than Christian faith. I really do, civil religion. Mm -hmm. And well, I think it makes a lot of room for people of other faiths. We're a spiritual country. We have a, a spiritual uh, traditions that are, that are to be applauded. But they don't have to be um, fought tooth and nail uh, on the steps of the Capitol because your particular brand of Christianity is not being carried forth as you see it. That ras I mean, radical difference, I think, between the two. I think Christian nationalism is a subset of civil religion. Um, it's a more extreme version that says we're not just a nation that's composed of millions of believers, but a nation conceived by a particular religious idea that's destined to be advanced by people of a particular kind of religious faith. And that's the kind of religious faith that was getting advanced on, on uh, and fought for, and people ready to die for it on January 6th. Pastor Byrne? Yep. I would be really surprised if very many of the people that were there understood that or held that, you know, they didn't know what they believed. They wanted to go and raise hell and, and be noticed and... Might be. So, so why are they carrying uh, a Jesus Saves flag? Anybody can carry a flag. Yeah. You know, thought it was a good idea, yeah. some of them. I mean, some knew what they were doing, what they were up to. But I don't think they all did. I, mean, I, I think there's some truth to that, Al. I wouldn't disagree with like, that for a minute. Like sheep. Yeah. Well, and it's going to be an exciting day. I've got to be there type thing. Yeah. 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 It's fun to be there. Yeah. I, I think Biden says, God bless our troops, because he's still really hurting from the death of his son. And his son was a soldier. And there have, mm -hmm. I think, Jill, too, uh, you know, I think that's having lost a son. I know that son, my own son, I know that son is always on your brain. And I think that's why he says it. I think thinking, you're right. Lois. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when you get down to it, whether they know it or not, Al, I think they, they feel like as, the, as, as Christian nationalists have been spoken to, maybe preached to sometimes, yeah. that you are deathly afraid that you could, you're one election away, one stolen election away from this country going totally downhill. And no matter who put that thought in your heads, it has a way of coming out and for some people, they're all too ready to resort to violence uh, if that's what it takes. They're willing to shed blood. I just watched it. We watched a television show Sunday this past week uh, on CNN called Assault on Democracy. And that was specifically exploring the roots of January 6th and why it matters today. And they interviewed and had a lot of clergy from different parts of the country on there who are very much into this Christian nationalism and what they were saying and preaching and so on to their congregations uh, is really, it's enlightening, I think, to hear. Yeah. They did a good job of reviewing that. Um, I'm sorry, what was yeah, the name of the show? Uh, it's called Assault on Democracy, and uh, exploring the roots of January 6th, why it matters. CNN, it was just on uh, two days ago on Sunday. It was on Sunday, the January, uh, okay. June 20th. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do know in talking to, believe it or not, casually, I was talking to, my mother move, was moving uh, at that time, and I was talking to the, a lady online who said that she was a former trucker and that her son flew from Alaska to be a part of this demonstration, clearly showing you had to plan ahead. People yeah. were coming from all over, planning mm -hmm. ahead to take part in this demonstration. Yeah, no, they took it seriously. They were, the call to take up arms, whether they had guns or not, there was certainly a call to, to be willing to shed blood and lay down one's life. Yeah. A couple more mm -hmm. questions that I want to ask you today. 
and one of them's kind of personal because of where I have a home in the Twin Cities, but how do you respond to violent protest? Hmm. Talk to me about that. What do you think about violent protest? This is John. I feel it's never appropriate. Protests are fine. Violence really doesn't solve anything. Okay. So then your argument against the Christian nationalism assault on the Capitol is violence never, no matter what they stood for. That's my feeling. Uh, I, I have to say that there could be situations such as Nazi Germany where things are so bad that violence may have to be used to combat something. There has to be a certain reason for combating something. And I don't feel we're at that point in this country that there's a need to physically combat things. Okay, nicely said, John, thank you. Somebody else, what do you think about protests, violent protests? I will say that, I, this is Rebecca Nessie, I believe that violent protest is wrong, that it turns people against your cause that you are trying to promote. I thought violent protest was wrong in the case of even George Floyd. You know, the, he died and I did not feel that violent protest, protest was, should have been done and was done and I support the protest of that, but when it turned violent, I do not support it. Yeah. Cheryl here, the only violent protest that Jesus did that we know of was throwing the money changers out of the temple. Yeah, he doesn't get credit for that one, doesn't he? He does, yeah. <laughs> well, he overturned the people too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. I uh, very taken. I spent quite a bit of time before the the trial at 38th in Chicago. My brother lives just a couple, three blocks away and spent maybe a couple, three hours there. And it was very stark and telling. And of course, there's a big picture of George Floyd there right along the street. Now, I think they've since opened up that street back to traffic again, but this certainly was a shrine. Uh, they wanted us not to forget what had happened there and uh, did an effective job with it, I think. Our history, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I, I, I Go ahead, who is talking? Oh, Phil, but I, I'm willing to listen. I, I've said plenty. I mean, our history, uh, 1517, on the door of the Wittenberg Church, what did that guy do? 99 Theses. 99 Theses, and I don't think he put him up with a slipper. Um, and so we've kind of got a little bit of that in our past, like it or not, and we are named uh, as Protestants, which comes from protest. I'm not saying that they were shooting people or killing people, but it certainly caused a revolution that was, you could argue, radical. Uh, I think one of the reasons I like to ask the question, I, I think by far the majority of, I've done a few studies, uh, by far the majority of protests that happened after George Floyd were peaceful, but it's easy to turn them all into Black Lives Matter, all, all hell is breaking loose kind of thing. And, and I really think that's a little unfair. Um, I, I also think that we forget, you know, back in the days of the American Revolution, there was a fair amount of protest, the Boston Tea Party and the Stamp Act, and there was a variety of things that happened. I'm not defending it. I don't like violent protest at all. It doesn't fit my picture of Jesus at all. But there's just a little part of me that wants to be somewhat understanding to some people that stand up and make a little noise. Uh, and sometimes may, maybe your hammer is pounding on the door of that church, you know? And well, so that's a good comment. Actually, this is Rebecca, Pastor Vern. You know, maybe people wouldn't have been as, you know, that did the violence around the John, the, the George Floyd protests make people more sympathetic? I don't know. Did, yeah. did it bring more support? I don't know. It's, it's, it's it's attention, that's for sure. Yeah. But when they start burning down buildings and such that 
It's no, hard. No, yeah, I've driven, hard. I've been to 38th in Chicago uh, and Vern knows I grew up in South Minneapolis, uh, not far from there. Uh, and, but I've also been driven in Augsburg. Uh, sometimes I drive across Lake Street on Hiawatha and, and right, that's where the third precinct was burned. And that's quite a ways from 38th in Chicago. Yeah, it is. Uh, and uh, so th those, and then people started going along Lake Street. But there, the problem too with protests is there are always people who come in and take advantage of it. Yeah. And, and they hide under the guise of the other protesters. Yeah. Um, and and they, uh, they're, they're just the, anarch there are anarchists and, uh, uh, and, and there are people who just seize upon, we, we, there are even some, you know, they figure, figured out who was uh, causing some of the fires. It was a guy from Rochester who said some of the fires, right? Yeah, had nothing to do with Black Lives Matter and had nothing to do with uh, George Floyd. He just uh, wanted to go and burn things. And um, go ahead. Well, there's another factor that during the pandemic, there was a huge increase in the sales of guns. Yeah, very, very significant. So we're even more of an armed camp than uh, we'd been before. And uh, a lot of that right now actually is going on around the University of Minnesota for the last three months. So I've uh, become a regent uh, on the board of the university. And we get letters practically every day from parents who are concerned because there are shootings in Dickey Town and areas, you know, right, not on, but right around the campus of the university. People are concerned that they're children aren't safe, there, there has been an increase in violence. There's no doubt about it. And actually even, I'm kind of shocked reading not infrequently in Rochester now, shootings and, and killings uh, around parks and other places in town um, haven't really been something we've had to think a whole lot about in the past. So I think that, you know, the increase in guns and the stresses of the pandemic and a number of things are, are not the greatest situation. So something we really have to pay attention to. So right now the university is, their police and the Minneapolis police and everybody is really, really having up their game to try to keep the campus area even reasonably safe yeah. in Minneapolis, as an example. We are a cooped up people, and I think sociolo sociologists will be studying this for a long time. Uh, the way that it's affected us, that sense of languishing, um, uh, we're, we're not thriving, we're not flourishing, we're cooped up and locked up and um, we're, we're not doing very well some days, that's for sure. Last question, people, thank you for your patience, but I think it's worth asking the question. Um, I don't care if you answer it directly, but maybe what's one way that you could build a bridge of understanding and peace in the midst of the world in which we're living? What could you do? What's something you could do in the midst of this social political morass we're in well i I'd, I'd add Vern to to our congregational mission statement i would add the word justice okay build bridges of ju justice, justice and peace and so i think working for justice is a uh, is a big part that is work we can do okay and um and certainly peace and understanding come with it but absolutely justice is an important part of it thank you what else would you do people what else could you do I think we've got to stop demonizing the other, including those that have gotten sucked into all of this craziness with this, you know, mm -hmm. attack on the Capitol and stuff, and try to talk to people as people, because um, fear and confusion has caused a lot of this angst. And uh, uh, I know there are organizations, informal anyway, that are trying to get people of opposing viewpoints to just talk to one another, not you know, condemning each other, but just talk why I believe this or why I think that and listening. And maybe we can get people talking to one another again. And this is John, I'm gonna add in that I feel that assumptions are dangerous. Yep, I would agree. This is Rebecca. I will share an action that I took um, this Christmas with my cousin who got sucked into QAnon, and this is before the January 6th event. Um, I believe that a lot of her difficulties have stemmed from the death of her son. Um, trying to think it was five years ago, maybe. Uh, she's been depressed ever since he died. 
and she goes online and looks for answers and looks for this and looks for that. He died of an, acci an accidental overdose. She didn't even know he had a drug problem. Um, and uh, I believe she's been really depressed. So I wrote her a letter and said, you know, I love you, I care about you, and I encourage you to seek counseling and treatment for your chronic depression because it shows in the things that you write and that you are, are putting online. So I encouraged her to seek help and told her I loved her, whatever. Thank you. Important. Here's another thought. Um, we could think about what people like us have contributed to this problem. Uh, one example might be the extreme left is probably almost as dangerous as the extreme right. Maybe we could profess more of a center approach to things rather than support the left and afraid to lose the support of those on the extreme left. Okay, thank you, Jim. You're still waiting for that article from me, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can find some, I got a lot of them. Okay. I read Ben Sass book. He's the senator from Nebraska, and mm -hmm. I, it's called Them. I think that's it's up on my shelf. And basically, I think the last the last chapter was we need more tribes. Um, you know, we need to not be afraid to name who we are, but find some ways to at least live into that those differences and quit demonizing the other side as them. Yeah. You know? I, I really think we could spend a little more time reading Jesus. And it's so easy to think that we know what Jesus stands for and does and believes in. And uh, if nothing else, we could just live with the conviction of what we believe deeply about Jesus. We don't have to hit other people over the head with it, but it's hard to, it's hard to fight against Jesus when you have a firm conviction about him. So... Uh, learn about Jesus, get a little righteously indignant in a good way, and uh, share it. Live that conviction with others. Anything else? What can you do? Well, this is Deborah, and I think that change always starts with ourselves, and I think that as humans, we have implicit biases about different groups of people that we tend to, you know, stereotype and describe things to behaviors to or what characteristics. And I, I think we have to challenge ourselves to figure out like, how did we learn how to think about other people and what groups or whatever they belong to. So that's how I think it has to begin is that self reflect that self reflection. Nicely said. Yeah. Uh, we can befriend people that don't think like us or you know that you, you read uh, some of the articles and it's like, I can, I can think of another person who voted for such and such a candidate because we spend a lot of time in our silos. And so let's go find some of those folks and become friends or just talk to each other. Good point. And then examine our own life in the process. And we are each created by the Lord. Each one of us is his. We are each unique. And we are made in God's image. God's image. And that we are maybe think of us as citizens of the world, not citizens of just Rochester or Minnesota or the U.S., but expand our horizon and to talk, as Lois said, to have more conversations, to learn about other people, to, to enjoy the differences and, and expand our knowledge, and to be mindful, to, to let our mind work in its best way. Thank you. That's a good point. I would say, if we're all children of God, why are we so afraid of each other? Great question. Great question. Why don't we just leave it at that? John, you get the last word. Um, it's nicely said. Um, there's a lot of children of God out there. Uh, we can see some of them on our screen, but a lot of them are at Rochester Fest, and some of them are in Washington, D.C., and some of them belong to the Proud Boys and uh, a variety of other things, too. And yeah. going out there and doing a little work and living in the name of Jesus and with some conviction and uh, maybe building a bridge of not only understanding, but justice and peace. You know, there's, there's things we can do that don't involve reinventing everything, but that involve a step or two or three or a conversation or two or three that can make a, 
can make a difference that's significant. So I, I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you for taking part in this conversation. It's important. It really is. And uh, glad we could have it tonight. So you all take care, OK? Thank you. Bye to all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Enjoy.